listening to SOJC Radio, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and teaching the doctrine of Christ to the whole world. Good evening and welcome to Friday night FOJC Remnant Gathering. Grab your Bible and your pens and your paper and when two or three are gathered in his name, the Lord is right here with us. So thank you for joining us and here's Brother David. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the October 27th edition of the FOJC Remnant Gathering. Here we are, October 2023, and it just seems like time is flying by. That's the way it seems to me. We're so thankful for each and every one of you joining us for the broadcast tonight. It's going to be entitled Lying Prophets and Hungry Lions, and so thankful for all of you that are joining us. Uh, An announcement, our October Prayerathon will be Monday, October 30th, 6 p.m., on the Underground Church FOJC Radio YouTube channel, and prayer requests sent to our email for our monthly Prayerathon meetings must have Prayerathon in the subject line. And we will also be taking requests, we'll have the team here, at Ground Zero, we'll have some of our rowdy friends uh, by remote. We're going to pray. We're going to call it, uh, instead of having a trunk or treat party, we're going to call it Throw the Devil in the Trunk prayer meeting. We're just going to throw him in the trunk and dump the trunk down in the abyss. And it's certainly time to pray, isn't it? We've got to, we've got to understand that prayer is uh, what we must do. And we're so thankful to be able to do that this Monday night. And we will be doing our very best to pray for all the requests that come forth in uh, the chat during that time. So join us for that and uh, help us unite together in prayer. Um, Many other requests. Leah, breast cancer. And uh, her husband's trying to get custody of her children. Uh, Melissa's children. Uh, Matthews in prison and Taylor for salvation and healing. Um, also, Laura, uh, prayer, or, or excuse me, Myra, uh, prayers for the salvation for her children. Uh, Ken's daughter, Jasmine, uh, is in a situation there in a, in a broken home. Uh, Matthew, uh, cleansing from smoking. And just so many things. I I call this season, uh, you know, and I've said here a while back, we're going to have a whiz-banger Halloween. And I was talking last week about I believe that the when we see the reuniting of the uh, Tartarian Empire, that the breaking up of that in the days of Noah's grandchildren was the great binding. I think this could be the great loosing. And the uh, spirits of hatred and division and strife are rampant. And it, it's just amazing. Our whole, the, all of the earth is being filled with hatred and violence and strife and contention. It's a raging spirit. And none of this takes the Lord by surprise. And uh, we just need to be with that one now that calms the storm in our life and just let the love of God fill our hearts. And let the peace of mind, peace of God that passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you once again for this opportunity and this great privilege to come before a loving, all-powerful God and to bring our requests before you. Lord, we lift lay up to you. That is breast cancer and problems within her home father we just pray that these spirits of division be replaced with spirits of love melissa's children for matthew who's in prison and for taylor for salvation and healing father just send the holy spirit to comfort and to convict and correct where necessary father we want to pray for jasmine That is in a situation where she's being influenced by forces that will not take her the right way. Father, we pray for Jasmine that you'll just draw her close to you and give her clarity and thought. 
and purpose in our life. Father, we just want to pray for Matthew for cleansing of uh, iniquity and all defilement that you'll just purge him and make him a vessel that is fit for your use. Father, we want to pray for FOJC and Now You See TV. Lord, we see the storms raging and we just pray, Father, that we just get in the boat with you that are calming the storm and we love you and we thank you for all that you do. Remember John and uh, keep him strong. We know you will. And Father, we pray for this broadcast tonight. And Lord, I want to lift Don up to you also. Lord, just help her in all of her struggles that are ongoing with all of the issues she has to deal with. Father, just, just help her. We know that you do, and we just ask for a special blessing upon Sister Donna this evening. So Lord, as we come to you tonight, we just ask you to bless this message. Help me to bring forth your word in clarity and truth. Just open the hearts of the people to receive anything that's from you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Worship the Lord for a few moments, and we're going to be back with our message for this evening, Lying Prophets and Hungry Lions. We're sorry, but because of copyright rules, you cannot hear my music. However, if you want to hear the message in its entirety with my music, you can join us on the radio page on Friday night for the live audio broadcast at 6 p.m. Central Time, or you can listen on our podcast page at fojcradio.com. Here's Brother David. Turn your Bibles to First Kings chapter 13 verses 1 and 2 and behold there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense and he cried against the altar and the word of the Lord and said O altar altar thus saith the Lord behold a child shall be born unto the house of David Josiah by name and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee and man's bones shall be burnt upon thee. This was a very bold statement by a very bold man. He goes right in to Bethel, that was the seat of the idolatrous worship, and there the king of Israel, Jeroboam, was getting ready to burn incense upon this altar. And this this prophet, being obedient to the Lord, he went and rebuked the king of Israel right in front and in the midst of his idolatrous worship. Now I think this is a big lesson for us all of what God thinks against idolatry. God hates idolatry. He hates it in all forms and he commands his people to separate from it. It's not a um, uh, an electric thing but it's something that we must do. It's the very heart of God that he hates idolatry in Ezekiel chapter 18 and the 32nd verse we also see the heart of the Lord where he says for I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth saith the Lord God wherefore turn yourselves and live the Lord does what he does not because he has any desire to hurt anybody but he does what he does to turn people from their error and their sin that they might repent. And there's a great lesson in the action here of the man of God. Those who go on God's errand must not fear the face of man. And this is certainly true. We have to be able to put uh, the fear of man out of our heart and out of our mind when we do what we do. And in the book of Proverbs, chapter 29 and verse 25, the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. The fear of man bringeth a snare. And we have to be able to get the fear of man out of the way in, in the decisions of what we do. Now, in... Um, Uh, Richard Baxter, the Puritan, wrote a book, The Sin of Craving the Favor of Man. And I love this guy. And I tell you what, he's helped me through a lot of tough situations with his wisdom. 
And there's a couple things I'd like to read to you. It says, remember that all men are so selfish that their expectations will be higher than you are able to satisfy. They will not consider your occupations or hobbies or what you do for others. Most of them look to have so much of your time as if you had nobody else to mind them. Many times when I had an hour a day to spend, a multitude of people have expected that I should have spent it with them. And there are many people, and I know a lot of them mean well. They're not meaning bad, they're meaning well. But there are people that you just can't give your time to. And you have to make decisions, you have to manage your time. And there are people that don't respect this and get offended and want to take up your time. And there's there are just places where uh, the love of God has to be our rule and we have to love the work of the Lord in such a way that we have to respond to it. Um, something else Brother Baxter said here. Um, he said, uh, you will find that criticism is a common vice. Few are competent judges of your actions because they can never know the entire case that led to your choices. Yet nearly everyone will attempt to register a complaint against you at some point. A proud, presumptuous understanding is also a very common vice which thinks itself capable of judging as soon as it hears even a small piece of the case. And it is not conscious of its own fallibility, even though it daily experiences it. And there's, there's such a balance that we have to walk. And certainly, it is right and proper to call out sin. There's nothing wrong about that. And w when it comes to the issues, we're here at the time of Halloween. And there are situations, and we get so many emails of so many people. There's broken homes, and there's... Uh, there's the other parent involved, and there's all these messes and all these confusions. And the issue of the holidays is a constant uh, pain that people have to deal with. And I, I try, you know, uh, I try not to be judgmental of people. I just, and of course I can't be. And like Brother Baxter said, uh, I, I, when you don't know all the situations of the case, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. But the Bible says what it says and the Bible says what it says about idolatry and our separation from it and the Holy Spirit will lead us to do those things and you know there's times when uh, we have to make people have to move up and make changes so this is where we're at you know and there's so many situations that will be coming up around Christmas with all of these things and the bottom line is we have to remember God hates idolatry God hates idolatry. And I know in family situations, this makes it very tough for um, a lot of people have to do things that, that are tough. But, you know, we have the, the main thing is we have to be true to the Lord. So that's it. We have to do the hard thing sometimes. So uh, that's, that's what we got to keep in mind, man. And it, it ain't easy. And I tell you what, the devil is having a heyday in, in this hour with with all of these things. But in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10, uh, it says here, For now, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. We absolutely have to put man-pleasing out of our mind. And this is hard. And as we see in our study today, some of the people that uh, were influencing for the bad were people that claimed to be prophets of God. And in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, I did a sermon one time called The Gift of Hard Head. The Gift of Hard Head. And it says here in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. As an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. Fear them not, neither dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. We have to have a hard head. And you know, when someone is coming against you, you get the look, don't you? You get the look, and they give you that. Uh, they want to intimidate you. And in the issues of idolatry, 
and in the issues of serving God and standing where he wants us to stand, we have to have the gift of hard head. And a lot of times when people come against us and they'll look you in the eye, uh, you just have to make that decision right then, that it's not the fear of man or the intimidation of man that is going to sway us, but it is going to be the word of the Almighty God. And the big one of them, and there's so many lessons that we can learn from our text today, but one of these is that idolatrous worship won't stand forever. The king of Israel was offering up incense upon the idol altar. He was rebuked, and that come to an end real quick. But the word of the Lord will endure forever. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. The society wants to tell us that the biblical norms that were taken for granted, even in our nation for so many years, that these are gone, that they have changed. No, what has changed is the idolatrous religious system and our idolatrous nation. But that nation and that idolatrous worship will end. But the word of the Lord will stand forever. In Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 35, we know that the words of Jesus will stand forever. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. When we stand with the word of God and we stand with the doctrine of Christ, we are standing with something that is eternal. It will not change, and it will not pass away. Let's go on in our text in 1 Kings chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 3 and 4. Thirteen, excuse me. 1 Kings 13. And we're going to look at verses 3 and 4. And he gave a sign that same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass, when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand which he put forth against him dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. Radical obedience will bring radical protection. This man spoke against the very king, and as the king of Israel reached forth his hand to grab him, God smote that hand. Now, I want you to notice, and there are so many things, but the king of Israel, he didn't say, help me to repent. Help me to repent and turn from my sin. Forgive me. But he said, no, restore my hand. He wasn't concerned with the sin he was committing, but he was concerned with the physical pain that he was experiencing. And I want you to notice that this was a sign. The Lord gave a sign. And as we stand and we face all of the conflicts that we have, we have to remind ourselves that it is not the people that are coming against us, that are enemies. But it is indeed those principalities and powers. In Ephesians 6 and 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And indeed, King Jeroboam was not the enemy, though he certainly was an enemy, but it was that spirit what was, that was driving him. Matthew Henry said this. He said, The message delivered in God's name, not whispered, but cried with a loud voice, denoting both the prophet's courage that he was neither afraid nor ashamed to own it. And this is something that's so true regarding preaching the word of God. When you preach something that's not popular, if, if it's right, and the Lord is prompting you to do it, you can be ready to accept the consequences. He goes on to say, it was re- directed not to Jeroboam, nor to the people, but to the altar, the stones of which would sooner hear and yield than to those who were mad upon their idols and death to divine calls. There's a word that is used in, in the Bible 
about idolatrous worship. It said the whore of Babylon made them drunk. They were drunk. And when a drunk, you can't reason to a drunk. You can't talk to a drunk. And that's why that the, the prophet of God did not even try to speak to Jeroboam, but he prophesied to the altar. And Brother Henry goes on to say, Yet in threatening the altar, God threatened the founders and worshipers to whom it was so dear as their own souls. And people are in love with idolatrous worship. They are in, so in love with the apostate religious system that they are deaf to what the Word of God says. They have set up a system of worship that is ignoring the Word of God in many, many, many obvious places. And it's time to prophesy against that idolatrous altar because judgment is soon going to begin at the house of God. And certainly, certainly, it's going to fall, and it's going to fall with a very, very severe vengeance. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 5, it says, The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Now, there is a sign here, and when the Bible talks about signs, the Bible talks about signs and wonders. And in the Gospel of Mark, in the Gospel of Mark, in the 16th chapter and the 20th verse, Mark chapter 16 and verse 20, the Scripture says, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. When that prophet went up and prophesied, it just wasn't words for people to say, well, I believe it or I don't, but it was confirmed with the sign following. That altar rent and the Lord backed up the words of that prophet. We are coming into a time when there is going to be a confirming of the covenant. There is going to be signs. It's going to be a time where the idolatrous religious system and the idolatrous nation must be called out and must be confronted. In the book of Daniel, chapter 9, and verse 27, And he, Jesus, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Now this is speaking of the last half of the 70th week of Daniel, and I'll just give you the truncated version here. We've done teachings on this uh, in, in much more in depth. But basically, there's a seven-year period. The first period, the first three and a half years came to an end when Jesus died upon the cross. He says, in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Jesus did this by dying on the cross and putting an end to all of the Jewish animal sacrifices and he says for the overspreading of the abominations he shall make it desolate even to the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate and I believe it's going to be desolate unto the time of the return of the Lord I believe that uh, the things that Israel is looking at they are looking at as we have said so many times that soon coming Iranian invasion which looks to be more and more probable each and every day that we live. Now, the thing we want to understand here, that the prophet moved out, he prophesied against the altar, and if you remember, the plagues of Egypt did not happen until Moses prophesied them. Moses would say, hey, tomorrow, Pharaoh, if you don't let my people go, we're going to have some frogs up in here. And Moses prophesied it, and then it fell. It was confirmed with signs following. The prophet against the altar here, he prophesied it, and it was confirmed. It was backed up. And the judgments of God must be prophesied, and the prophecy and the warning must go forth. And this is where we're at. The judgment of God is being prophesied, and it's not going to fall as deaf as just words, but these are going to be backed up in reality. And this will be how people will know the words of the true prophet from the words of the false. Now, in the 17th chapter of Luke, Luke chapter 17, we're going to begin in verse 22. 
And he said unto the disciples, The days will come when ye desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. Now in verse 22, one of the days of the Son of Man were the days that Jesus spent with his disciples. And after Jesus would go back to the Father, there would be, they would long to have his physical presence with them. And they shall say to you, See here or see there, go not after them, nor follow them. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But at first he must suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They, they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man shall be revealed. Now there are two days of the Son of Man. And there are the days of the Son of Man when Jesus was with them on earth. And there are the days of the Son of Man that will precede the return of Jesus. And there's going to be a three and a half year period that Jesus' word was confirmed when he was upon the earth, the days of the Son of Man. And there will be a three and a half year period where the confirmation of the covenant will take place in the last days before Jesus will return. And this is what it looks like. It looks like the old prophet at Bethel that prophesied even as the king was in the midst of the idolatrous worship and his hand dried up. This is where we're at. We're coming into the time of the confirmation of the covenant with signs following. And the lesson that this prophet experienced and this man of God, it's very, very important for us to read and understand. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 13, and let's go to verse 6, and let's read some more text. 1 Kings chapter 13 and verse 6, And the king answered and said unto the man, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God and pray for me that my hand may be restored. Yeah, don't pray about repentance. Don't pray about none of that. Just heal my hand. And the man of God besought the Lord and the king's hand was restored him again and became as it was before. The mercy and the grace of God even to those that oppose him. I am very, was very touched in something that stuck with me as I was reading the uh, autobiography of Charles Finney. And Brother Finney said that the Lord had enabled him to have kind thoughts even toward those that oppose him. And they certainly opposed him horrifically. In verse 7, And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, nor will I eat bread nor drink water in this place for so it was charged me by the word of the Lord saying eat no bread nor drink water nor turn again by the same way that thou camest so he went another way and returned not the way that came to Bethel he was given strict commandments by God he knew them he understood them he repeated the things that the Lord had told him unto the king the king of Israel could not turn the man of God. A lot of people can be bought. And I tell you what a lot of people do too. Well, well, not a lot of people. But there are people that think that they can give you money and control the ministry. Oh, yes, there are. There are those people out there. And uh, you cannot let, let money deter the mission and the message of God. Now, Let's read on on our text here a little bit. And while the king of Israel and the offer of wealth could not get this prophet on the wrong course, there was something that was able to get this man set 
in the wrong direction. Let's read it. Now, 1 Kings 13, 11. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king, then they also told to their father. And their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what the way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereupon, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. The very same that the king of Israel said unto him. When the king of Israel said, Come home to me and eat bread, and I'll give you a big reward, lots of cash. The man of the prophet said, No. But now we have a guy, and we have a prophet in Bethel. Now, number one, right off the top, this guy was in Bethel. He was there at the midst of the idolatrous worship that the king of Israel was leading, he didn't say a thing. This tells us right now that this guy is no prophet at all. I hear a lot of this. I hear people that are sitting in the midst of obvious idolatrous assemblies, and they want to say they're this. I'm this. I'm that. I'm God's little warrior. Well, you are nothing. And we should know immediately that this so-called prophet was no prophet at all because he could sit in the midst of the sewer pipe and not say a word. That should have been a clue right there. If he was the true prophet of God, he would have been rebuking the king and the idolatrous altar just like this man of God that was sent from God. Now he goes on to say, And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. Now, there's no doubt that this man that was sent to prophesy against the altar, he knew what the Lord told him. He repeated it to the king. He repeated it to this other man that claimed to be a prophet. But look what happens. In verse 18, he said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. He was a lying prophet. And what the king of Israel couldn't do, this lying prophet fooled this man because he came to him as a false prophet that knew God. Now, boy, oh boy, is there a lesson here, oh my goodness, and so very many. Now, I actually believe that the Lord speaks to me. I know that he does. But I would not ask any of you to believe anything I say because of some personal revelation the Lord has given me. You know, if you, that makes you, if you don't agree with me, that makes you have to confront me. You know, and that makes me the authority and not the Lord. So I would never do that, though I will share things the Lord uh, has said unto me, I would not use that in this way or in that manner. And in Acts chapter 8 and verse 9, the scripture says here, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. Let me tell you what, there are no great ones out there. We all are humble followers of the Lord. We all are to be taught, and we all are to hear the voice of God and follow him. And this is something the king of Israel could not sway this man, but someone coming to him, making him think that he was a prophet, and he that was heard from God. What this is, this is spiritual witchcraft. This is spiritual witchcraft. When someone will come to you, and try to change your course because of some supposed word for God or prophecy. And this man knew. 
He repeated it twice, what the Lord had told him, but yet he was fooled by this lying prophet that said he had a vision. This is so seductive, the, the, the charisma and the demonic anointing of people that these false prophets have. They are so good at it. You don't want to underestimate the danger here. What a brave man. What a brave man. What an obedient man. And to a point, but then he come to the lying prophet, and this lying prophet deceived him. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. And the scripture says here, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God, Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Ye have overcome them, well, who is them? Them is the false prophets. Them are the ones that are making themselves out to be someone great. There are some people that think they're so led of God that they're not capable of being an heir. Now let's look. I've got here the commentary by Howard Marshall. Let's just read some of his comments. And he said, other people may be taken in by the false teachers who deny Christ, but John does not believe that his children will do so. They have their source in God, and consequently they have the inner power of the truth to enable them to withstand error. Boy, that's so important. They have the inner power of the truth to enable them to withstand error. And think of this man. The king could not turn him. He repeated his marching orders to the king. He repeated his marching orders to this lying prophet, but he could not withstand this man that looked him in the face and told him that an angel had spoken unto him. We have to overcome anything and everybody that will steer us from fulfilling that gift and calling and purpose that God has for our life. He goes on to say, in this sense, they can be said to have overcome the upholders of false teaching. They have proved victorious over the temptation to accept false doctrine. And it, there's a temptation to accept false doctrine. And we must overcome them. He says something here that is so good. False belief is as much a sin as unrighteous behavior or lack of love. Let me read that again. False belief is as much a sin as unrighteous behavior or lack of love. Victory over it, however, is not due to any innate strength of believers, but rather to the fact that the one who lives them in them is greater, more powerful than the one who is at work in the world. God is mightier than the evil one. Praise God. And if we will just let that one manifest in our life, we will come through and stay the course, and we will not let anything or anybody turn us from that which we know the Lord has given us to do. What a lesson from the old prophet and the man of God and the old, the prophet of God and the old prophet at Bethel. Well, there's more things we need to say about this, and we're going to get down into some detail, and we're going to think about uh, just what, what was going on? You know, what was that guy thinking? You know, that lion prophet, why did he do that? And and I think a lot of it was he still wanted to be considered a prophet. He had blown it. He had lost it. He was absolutely not a prophet, or he would have been prophesying against the idolatry he was in the middle of. But he wanted to control 
that man of God. And we cannot let anyone control us. He wanted to control him. And he wanted to bring him down to his level, so you, so to speak. And he succeeded in doing that. But it was absolutely a lie. And people will lie to you. They will lie to you to your hurt and to your destruction. And we cannot let anything or anybody turn us away from following God and completing the mission that he has given us to fulfill. So with that, we're going to take a break. And i got a lot more to say and a lot of more things we need to think about, about lying prophets and hungry lions. We'll see what how this ends up in just a little bit. We'll be back in a moment. Hello, FOJC Radio Remnant family. Sister Donna here. I just want to thank all of you for your support and your love and kindness. Just wanted to let you know that here at FOJC Radio, we want to reach the world for Jesus. I know you know this verse. You've said it as a child probably many times. But as a reminder, in John 3, verse 16, 17, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In order to do this, we have chosen to use many different avenues. We have our regular Friday night message with Brother David, and then we have our Sunday night live, and we have different people on it, and then we have other Sunday night live programs with David and Tracy. Sometimes we're on Rumble, and sometimes we're on YouTube. You just never know who we might have on there. But I just wanted to remind you all, and thank you for your support, and give us a listen on Sunday Night Live. These programs usually start at 8 p.m. Central Time. You never know what we might be doing. We're full of all kinds of surprises. We want to reach the world for Jesus. FOJC Radio wants to introduce to our Remnant family the Holy Commission Boot Camp brought to you by Brother Brett Graham. These teachings are the basics or training for brothers and sisters in Christ's service. The Holy Commission is found in Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. Brett shares how we should walk with the Lord in order to accomplish the Holy Commission, and also some tips about soul winning. If you have questions about this series, please send them to lastdayschurch at cs.com and put capital HCBC in the subject line. You can find playlists for the Holy Commission Boot Camp on our Rumble and our YouTube channels. And thank you, as always, for your prayers and support. Oh, 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 
done. We cannot escape in chasing run. We have been adopted with sons and daughters. We he loves and forgives and we're called to be free. Sing a million questions and touch it for me and Jesus all through the land. Sing a million questions and touch it for me and Jesus all through the land. Sing over Father, lift your voice and sing. Look in love for Jesus and praise to Him ring. You are not alone, so others you can see. We are one of theirs, it's on the army. Sing a million questions and touch it for me and Jesus all through the land. Sing a million questions and touch it for me and Jesus all through the land. Now back to tonight's message with Brother David Carrico on FOJC Radio. Welcome back to the FOJC Radio, FOJC Remnant Gathering. And as I always do at the break, I want to sincerely thank each and every one of you that prays for us and that studies for us and that supports us with your gifts and with your kindness. We do appreciate it from the very bottom of our heart. After the broadcast tonight, I will be on uh, Spiritual Warfare Friday with Dan Badandi. And um, I'm looking forward to that. And we'll be tomorrow night on Midnight Ride. Uh, we're going to be, John will be doing a study leading us on looking into Islam. So as always, I will be looking forward to being with John over there on the Midnight Ride. And um, there you go. Thank you all so very much. And we've got some more things that we want to say and we want to look at. And um, let's get back to it in the Word of God. Now, let's go to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27. And I think this is the great lesson for us all. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you and ye need not that any man teach you but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things and is truth and is no lie even as it hath taught you ye shall abide in him you don't need any man to teach you so what am I doing here huh well I am here to and, and there is the gift of teaching uh, there is a gift of teaching. It is one of the gifts of, that God gives in the ministry gifts. But ultimately, there's only one teacher. And as I like to put it, the Bible says in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. But we have only one teacher, and that is God. And this is it. You know, this man had his marching orders from the Lord. He knew what it was. He repeated it twice. And it's going to cost this man his life. He's going to be taken out by the judgment of God. And what a sad thing. After being so obedient to the Lord, he is fooled by another individual that said an angel spoke to them. And he winds up getting eaten by a lion. But the the people, many times, um, and I'll read something here uh, that Brother Matthew Henry had to say. He said this. He said, false prophets 
have ever been the worst enemies to true prophets, usually aiming to destroy them, but sometimes as here to debauch them and to draw them from their duty. And it's like if some people are sinning, you know, it's like if some people, well, just for instance, if they want to eat pork or they want to profane the Sabbath, they'll, they'll want to get you to do it too. It'll make them feel better. You know, it's that type of thing. They want to drag you down to their level. And the person walking in obedience, there are many times that people claim to be true people of God that they will try to get you to compromise. And the thing of it is, the word of the Lord is the word of the Lord. And when we know the word of the Lord, that's what we follow. And any fear of man or any so-called prophets or prophetic words, don't be shaken by them. It was said, Jesus said of John Baptist, what do you expect to see? When you go out there to see this man that's preaching repentance, what do you expect to see? A, a reed that's blowing in the wind? Someone that's going to blow in the wind? Every time, and I tell you what, it's, I have to disagree with Bob Dylan. The answer, my friend, is not blowing in the wind. It's in the Word of God. And when we get it, we follow that, and we won't let anything turn us from the left to the right. And we have to realize one of our biggest temptations and our biggest enemies are going to be people that say they're believers that God has spoke to them. God has told me. God has showed me. Well, I'm sorry about you. We have to be do what the Lord has showed us. We cannot turn from the left hand or to the right. Now, in 1 John chapter 14 and verse 16, or excuse me, in the Gospel of John, chapter 14 and verse 16, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Allos paraclete another of the same kind and what the holy spirit was the holy ghost was to be to us after jesus went back to heaven just what jesus was to them when he was on earth with them they longed to see one of the days of the son of man and jesus gave them another comforter that would be with them just like he was with them when he was on the earth with them, praise God. And in verse 26, this is the scripture that I love. This is the scripture, one of the many of them that changed my life. If we can just understand this and we can come into the, really let the Holy Ghost come into the office of teacher. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The Holy Ghost will bring to our remembrance, which means you're going to have to have known it, but he will bring to our remembrance those things that Jesus said, and we will be taught by God. And I can be wrong and you can be wrong, but Jesus cannot be wrong. And there are so many things that Jesus said that you, you don't interpret them. You either believe them or you don't. Jesus didn't say, interpret me and you'll have eternal life. He said to believe me. And this is where we're at. The, the prophet that was, that was deterred from his mission, he was slain and ate by a lion. And we're going to get to that in the text. Because he believed a man over God. And we've got to come to that place where you're not believing me. Just because I'm me and I'm saying it. But you have to believe truth from me because you see it in the word of God. You see it confirmed unto you in the words of Jesus. Amen. John chapter 16 and verse 13. John 16, 13. How be it when he... The Spirit of truth has come. He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will shew you things to come. He will guide you. Now, I don't want to break this to anybody to surprise anyone, but nobody walks this life out perfectly. And as we're all on our walk, 
and there are places that we need to move a foot this way or a foot that way, the Holy Spirit will guide us. As the Holy Spirit reveals truth to us, He will guide us into walking out this walk in a better and better way each and every day and year as her life goes on. But this is the difference between the Old Covenant and the New. The New Covenant is different from the Old in the very fact that people are directly taught by God through the Holy Spirit and are taught the doctrine of Christ by the Holy Ghost. Let's look at it. In, in Jeremiah chapter 31, and let's look at verse 33. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. And notice, this is a prophecy of the new covenant. We read this in the 8th chapter of Hebrews, where we see the this quoted in the book of Hebrews. And notice that the new covenant is with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, just like the old one. I'm on Jeremiah of 31, 33, and 34. But as we're often told, there's an old covenant with Israel, a new covenant with the church. No, there's an old covenant with Israel. There's a new covenant with Israel. There's only the Israel of God. And the Israel of God, the way now that you become a part of the Israel of God is through faith in Jesus Christ. Now let's read it. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it upon their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Now under the old covenant, they had the written law. But if all we have is a list of do's and don'ts, we're not going to do very well with it, none of us. None of us will be able to keep the law. It's in our inward parts. It is down within our hearts to obey God's law and please Him. People always do what they want to do. And when God has circumcised your heart to keep the law, and it's in your inward parts, you're going to want to keep it. And so many times today, this is used as a fluffy cliché, of people that say that God's law is no longer valid, they'll, and they'll say, well, I don't have to keep the Sabbath. God's law is written upon my heart. Well, if God's law is really on your heart and you're in your inward parts, excuse me, you will want to obey the Sabbath. What a terrible cop-out. And that is not going to cut it. That's not going to cut it. We're talking about God putting a spirit of obedience and a spirit of leading within your hearts where the Holy Spirit will guide you closer and closer to Him, not farther and farther away. I will put my law on their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Now look at verse 34. And they shall no more every man teach his neighbor. You see, and that doesn't mean that we can't help one another and all of that stuff and that it's not a bad thing for me here to teach the Word, but it means just this, that when the bottom line comes down to it, you need to have one teacher. You need to have the Holy Ghost confirming it to you. You need to get in your heart a sure path that no man or no angel can turn you from, and they shall teach no more any man his neighbor. And every man his brother, saying, Noble Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So be very careful when people come to you and they're wanting to tell you what you should do or shouldn't do because of some supposed vision or word for God that they have or because of some so-called super spirituality or that they are some great thing. This is a greater temptation. This is what made that mighty man of God fall. He withstood the king. He withstood the risk of losing his own life, but yet he was fooled by a lying prophet. This is a lesson that we cannot uh, ignore. This is something that's rampant now. This is something that we all have to become new covenant believers. And I know that we are. And I know I'm speaking to the choir, but I, this is really 
uh, it, it's so important. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 13. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. Now, what I want to teach you is how to be taught of God. That's the only thing I need to teach you. If you can get that the doctrine of Christ is the absolute ultimate authority and revelation of God, if you can study that and the Holy Spirit bring that to your remembrance and guide you in it, you'll figure it all out. You'll figure it all out. And it's, it'll come to the place, there are so many things that people struggle with understanding that if they would just believe Jesus, the confusion would stop. He didn't say Jesus doesn't teach two things on any issue. He always teaches one thing. And if we will believe him instead of interpret him, the unity of the body will start to come forth and manifest itself. In John, the 16th chapter, John chapter 16 and verse 13. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you. I think I've read that. I'll read it again. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will shew you things to come. We'll just give that a double differ. That was a good one, wasn't it? Now let's look at Romans 8.14. In Romans, the 8th chapter, and the 14th verse, the scripture says here, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And the Holy Ghost guides us. He reveals us unto us Christ. He reveals Jesus' words to us. And as we receive the truth from the Spirit of truth, we are led by the Spirit of truth. And he guides us. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. There must be this leading of the Holy Spirit. This leading of the Holy Spirit that is directly connected to the words of Jesus. You see, it was Jesus that sent the Holy Ghost to be another comforter. To be just to them now what he was to them then. And he does that by giving us the words of Jesus and supernaturally bringing us back. There are so many complex issues. There are so many things of division and contention. But when you stop listening to men and listen to the man, the confusion stops. All of these complex issues, and there are so many of them. I could do, uh, and we have done lessons on multitudes of them. If you listen to what Jesus said, then that confusion is going to stop. And then you will not be deterred by any so-called prophet of God that will try to come and tell you something to the contrary. In Jeremiah chapter 29, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 29, and let's begin in verse 11. Look at your neighbor and say, God's got a plan for my life. God's got a plan for my life. Each and every one of you that's born again and even those of you that aren't born again God's got a plan for your life and of course you're never going to realize that plan unless you are born again but in Jeremiah 29 11 I know the thoughts that I think towards you God's thinking about you right now God's thinking about you for I know the thoughts that I think toward you saith the Lord thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. There's an expected end in the plan God's got for each and every one of us. That's really kind of frosty, isn't it? Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Now, God's got a plan for your life, and I think, I don't think there's probably... Anyone here that's born again and knows the Lord that could not say that you have messed up. <laughs> you know, you've not just been perfect from start to finish. You know, when you come out of the when you come out of the chute, you didn't go straight from the starting gate straight on the course. I tell you what, I have done things to hinder the plan that the Lord was wanting to work out in my life. I've got off to the left hand to the right. But the Holy Spirit has guided me, rebuked me, and brought me back and put me on the course 
to where it's heading toward that straight and that narrow gate. Now, ever I think all of us could say, yeah, we've done that. You know, we've messed up. Uh, we have went the wrong way. We went left when we should have went right. Now, what does God do? You know, when when we go one way, when he says we should have won another, does he say, you know, we'll just take you and throw you in the trash can? Well, here here's the way the Lord thinks. And he's thinking about you right now, by the way. Romans eleven twenty nine for the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. For the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. The Holy Ghost gives gifts severally and divides them unto people as he will according to the plan of God he's got for your life. And he doesn't change his mind about that because he is right. Now, God has a plan for all of our lives and it doesn't change just when we mess it up. So obviously what we are to do is just to let the Holy Spirit guide us and to bring us back on course where the Lord can bring forth that in our lives that he wants to do. Now, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 14, and I think before we read that, I need to get back. There's some more text in 1 Kings 13 that I want to read. We want to read the the rest of this story here, um, how it winds up. And I know many of you know the story, but let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 13, and let's pick it up in verse 19. And... Um, the man that prophesied against the altar when this old prophet told him an angel had spoke to him to come back and eat with him in verse 19 to 1 Kings 13. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water in direct contradiction to what he knew the Lord had told him. And it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back and he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, but camest back, and hast eaten bread, and drunk water in this place, of the which the Lord did said to thee, Eat no bread, and drink no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto, unto the sepulchre of thy fathers. Now this is just too much, isn't it? The obedient man of God was fooled by a lying prophet. He goes and eats and drinks in his house. And then God moves upon the lying prophet to rebuke the man of God that disobeyed. Now that's just, that's just amazing, isn't it? It's just absolutely amazing. And obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than than sacrifice my goodness what what a, and and what a sad story and it goes on to say in verse 23 and it came to pass after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back and when he was gone a lion met him by the way and slew him and his carcass was in the way and the ass stood by it and the lion also stood by the carcass now this is something <laughs> you know doesn't happen uh, when a lion kills someone, he'll gobble them down. And if a lion uh, had just killed somebody, that ass wouldn't just be st standing around there. There was something uh, that was just speaking of supernatural judgment here all the way. And behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way and the lion standing in the, by the carcass. And they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt and what a sad way for a very brave man of God to end up and certainly there is a lesson there for all of us isn't it now in the 14th chapter of Ezekiel let's begin in verse 4 and let's just read a little bit here therefore speak unto them and say unto them thus saith the Lord God every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet. I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. You see, it doesn't say when a person has idols in his heart, that could be jealousy, envy, 
pride, a lot of those things that, you know, you can, uh, a lot of sins are very visible, but a lot of them are not. And many of the idols in the heart that cause people to hear false revelation from God, they're those unseen things that are not readily visible. And the Lord will actually allow the person that has an idolatrous heart to hear things that they think is from God that really aren't to bring judgment upon them. That happens much more than what we would want to realize. And there's a reason for it in verse 5, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart because they are all estranged from me through their idols. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. The beginning of this lesson began with God's attitude against idolatry. We must not forget that. We must not forget that. For every one of the house of Israel or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separateth himself from me, and setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself, and I will set my face against that man, and I will make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And this is what happened to both of these prophets. It happened to the prophet that prophesied against the altar. He disobeyed. He became a sign and a proverb. Also, the, the, the false prophet that deceived him, both of these men, the judgment of God be upon them. You see, we have to have, we have to be taught of God and not turn from the left hand to the right. And in verse 9 it said, And if the prophet be deceived when he has spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand upon him, and I will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel, and they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. Whoa, boy. Now, there's false prophets out there everywhere that are going to tell you what you want to hear. They're going to say there's someone great. They're all this. They're all that. And the bottom line is, people that follow false prophets, you're going to get the same judgment that a false prophet gets. This is the new covenant. This is the new covenant, praise God. Every one of his children is taught by God. That means all of us, praise God. What a joy. What an opportunity to be taught by God. And each and every one of us are. This is the new covenant. The law is upon our hearts. The love to fulfill it is upon our hearts. The words of Jesus are in our hands in our Bible. The Holy Spirit is in our heart to reveal that and guide us, you see. And there's absolutes. There are moral absolutes that will guide us as a steady path through this life from this world unto the next. And those God's law is not grievous. His commandments are not grievous. But they are a joy under the hearts of those that love him and want to obey him. And I think with that, we're going to close our teaching for this evening. As always, with great thanks to each and every one of you that have joined us for our study this evening. I want to say that uh, there will be a new um, Holy Commission boot camp coming up this week. Also, oh boy, yeah. Sunday night, there's going to be an upload. It's not going to be a live stream, but it's going to be an upload. Brett Graham and I have done a teaching called Helps to Holiness. And this will be going up Sunday night about 8 o'clock on our YouTube channel and our Rumble channel. And I was so pleased with the way that turned out. I was so blessed to be able to work with Brother Brett on that. Uh, so, And that, like I say, after this show, I'll be over with old lonesome Dan Badandi on Spiritual Warfare Friday doing a broadcast with him this evening uh, as always we got a lot going on remember Monday we have our prayer thon and boy is it time to pray it is time to pray and um, we just have to remember as we see the wheels come off this old crazy world that none of this 
catches the Lord by surprise, that we can have peace in the midst of the storm, that we can have a sure guidance. There's going to be a lot of people uh, uh, come say, hey, you better do this, you better do that. So you better get your marching orders straight from the Lord right now because um, he will give you that sure peace and that sure word that you will know indeed that you are following the Lord. So, and also there's so many things, I'll forget one, but tomorrow night, absolutely, uh, John and I will be, no, yeah, that's right, tomorrow night, Saturday night, we'll be with John on the midnight ride, so we got it busy popping up in here, yeah, we do. Okay, Donna wants me to remind you again that uh, if if you want a prayer for the prayerathon, uh Put prayerathon in the subject line, and we'll be sure to include that or show up Monday night, and we're going to do everything we can to get each and every request prayed for that comes in. And I tell you what, that's a lot of work, and we're going to have some folks here um, on hands ready to pray, and we're, we're so thankful for that. So with that, we're going to close out our broadcast this evening as always with great thankfulness for each and every one of you and for the Lord for enabling us to once again to speak his word so with that until next Friday night 6 p.m. Central God bless you all and we'll see you then with the FOJC Remnant Gathering Thank you for listening and joining in fellowship with us here at FOJC Radio Remnant Gathering. You can contact us at FOJC Post Office Box 671 Tell City, Indiana 47586 or you can email us at lastdayschurch at cs.com or you may call us at 812-836-2288. You can check out our website at www.fojcradio.com. Thanks and God bless.